All right, so today marks our first real day of class. I think uh, last class is more the programmatic details of getting through the first day, but today we actually get to start with um, some more content. We're not going to start just yet in Photoshop. We'll save that for next week. But I like to spend uh, at least a day talking through some of the peripherally related stuff that has to do with working on computers, being in architecture, being a designer, who are you online, what services do you use, a lot of those kinds of things. And I used to save this for a little bit later on in the semester as kind of an afterthought. And I've learned, having taught this for a number of years, that it's better that we talk about this stuff earlier so that you can try to implement it during the semester than to talk about it as an afterthought later on. Um, I think this is vitally important to your uh, life, vitally important to your sanity as you go forward in the world of architecture. Uh, so it's worth really talking about it for a day. Um, we have a lot of stuff to cover. My lecture will be a little bit longer than usual. Um, but at the same time, the, the lab portion, you'll be able to get through it a little bit quicker than usual, even though there are a bunch of steps. It's just a lot of little disjunct things that I think come together and make a nice um, day of class. So um, I am very, very happy that we're back in this room. Hopefully you are as well. The screen is a lot better. The projector is a lot better. The computers are a lot better. Life is better um, in here. This is, this is kind of my room, so I don't want anybody to take it from me. Um, it's a little bit different setup. Um, I've, I've never done a night class in this room before, so it's obviously a lot darker than I thought it was. Uh, hopefully, I won't put you to sleep with the, the darkness in here. But at the same time, you guys get to see the screen a lot better than the day class does um, because it's a little bit brighter. So uh, we're going to talk about technology design uh, and the world of architecture. And we're going to start with organizing your digital life. Um, keeping the chaos at bay, how do you deal with your files, your calendars, your emails, and how does that organization help you in your life? So first thing I want to talk about is we're starting at the very basic level, and that is how do you store your files either on your home computer or on your flash drive such that they're in an organized fashion that you can actually get to. So there's two major strategies for storing your file. The first is kind of a flat, fat file system. And basically, what that means is you might have one catch-all folder that you put everything on. Right? Certainly, there are people out there, my dad probably is one example of this, that believe the desktop is the place where everything goes. Right? And if you get on his computer, you can't see a thing because there are so many things on his desktop. Now, my guess is that you're probably not in that boat, but some people are. The problem with something like this is you end up with a lot of stuff in a single folder. So in this example, I'm saying we start with a documents folder. Um, most modern operating system, whether it's uh, OS 10 on the Mac side or Windows on the PC side, s gives you a documents folder. And that tends to be where you store your stuff. Um, some people just throw everything in the documents folder. Some people might break it down a little bit more like, I have a folder called Word, and I put my Word documents in the folder called Word, which is certainly a reasonable way of doing it. The problem is you can end up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files that may all be Word files, but they end up going in the same folder. And you have to browse through every one of those 100 items to try to remember what you named that particular English paper okay? when you were sleep deprived and not paying any attention, that sort of thing. Right? So you really have to pay attention, and it takes a long time to get through it. Um, so that's a, certainly a disadvantage. The advantage would be I'm looking for an English paper. It's a Word document. I know where to go. It's got to be in this folder somewhere. Okay, so there are certainly advantages as well. The other option would be to set up some kind of a hierarchical system that would organize your work in some strategic manner that might be project-based rather than file type based. So if I were looking at a school example, maybe you have your documents folder inside of your documents folder. Maybe you have a school folder, uh, a work folder, a personal folder. I mean, it's obviously it's personal to you depending on what you're trying to store as to how you might organize it. Right? In this example, I picked on a school folder. Inside of the school folder, maybe you have separate classes, one for 135. You're in 121 with Daniel. Maybe you have a folder for that. You're in, uh, I don't know, 131 or 220 or whatever class you're in. Maybe you'll have some folders for those classes as well, You know, English, that sort of thing. And then you put files related to that class inside of that folder. Okay? It makes some sense uh, in terms of keeping certain projects together. So it's more of a project-based organization rather than a file type organization. Uh, and this can be really good, especially when you have lots of different files that come together to make up a particular project. So as we go forward in this class, we're going to be using InDesign as our primary graphic program. And if I was giving you, say, a poster to draw, 
or to, to lay out an InDesign, you may have the InDesign file itself, but you might have a lot of other stuff that goes with it, like images right, or text files that you've referenced and put into your InDesign file. It would be nice if all of those were in the same folder so that you knew this is all the stuff that goes with that one InDesign file. It's a good practice to get in as you get more and more complicated file systems. It's pretty easy to find your files still because if you separate it by class, for example, all you need to know is this is the class I'm looking for. It should show up in this particular class folder. Okay? It's pretty easy to keep your project separate. It's also easy when you have multiple things going on in your life. You have school, you have your school projects, you have work, you have your work projects. Right? It's a way to help organize your life in that sense. So obviously I'm a bit more of a fan of a hierarchical system, but I at least like to talk through it so you think about it when you think about how you store your files. All too often people just store their files in some manner and they don't actually think about it. And so if you think about it, you can develop a scheme that will help you down the road. Right? The other thing I'd like to point out is if you want the best of both worlds, if you store your files by project, like I'm suggesting, you can always do a smart search and find all the folders or all the files that are Word documents or find all the files that are PDF documents. And so you can essentially get the other type in addition to the hierarchical system. Right? So that's, a, that's an easier way. So if I were extrapolating this to you on your flash drive, which hopefully you brought today, or your hard drive, you might have the root of the flash drive, and inside of that, hopefully you'll have some kind of a folder that's backed up, like a Dropbox folder. Inside of that Dropbox folder, you'll have folders for your various classes, 135 being one of them. Right? Inside of that, maybe you'll break it down into, these are my assignments, these are my exercises. Right? Because those are the two primary things we produce in this class. And then you put logical files inside of that folder as well. So the next piece of the puzzle is how do you name your files? And naming your files is something that's personal. It's something that you have to kind of decide what works for you. I'm going to share with you how I would go about naming files or how I did go about naming files when I was in school because it seemed to work fairly well. It is by no means the right answer, but it is an answer. Okay? And instead of just picking random file names like my best project ever, right, .jpg or whatever, I try to pick something that relates to what class it is. And I do that in a way that goes before anything else. And that's a prefix. Okay? So I'm going to try to identify the project and the class that I'm doing it in. So let's say, for example, that I'm in 121 and Daniel's teaching it, Professor Abbott's teaching it. Okay? So I would assign a prefix of the subject, architecture, it would be A, the course number, 121, this is the course I'm in, followed by the first letter of the last name of the professor. So in this case, it would be Abbott. Okay? Now this is a little tricky and probably not necessary, probably a little bit too much detail for you guys at this stage, because you tend not to repeat classes. right? Maybe you have to take 121 again, but it's unlikely that you would. Let, in, in reality, chances are you're going to take 121 once. You're only going to take it one, with one person. So it doesn't really matter. You could call the prefix A121, architecture 121. That would be all you need. When you get to the grad level, uh, especially in the studios, you repeat the same class over and over again. You take a 201 studio three times. So you needed some way to identify that, yes, this is an architecture 201 studio, but I need something else that explains what it is. Uh, so that's why I added the, the professor who taught it. Um, but again, optional. We move to the end of the file name, and we're going to add an addition and a version. How many people number their files as they're going through? Right, a few of you. It's a very common practice when you reach a point to where you want to save your work, and then you want to try something new, but you're not sure you want to commit to it. Right? You save your work as addition 01, right? and you move on, save as addition 02, and you keep working in the hope that if what you do in z version 2 really sucks, you can go back to version 1 and keep going. Right? Very, very common in Studio to do this. So addition is those major revisions. I reach a fork in the road, and I want to go one way, and I might want to come back and go a different way. Okay? So we number those. A version is like a small tweak. So let's say that I was doing a Rhino rendering. I rendered out a particular scene. It was pretty good. I would save it as 02A, for example. But one of the textures was slightly off. It didn't quite look right. I go back, make some adjustments, save it as 02B, just in case I end up liking the first one better. But it's small adjustments. Is it necessary? Could I number them all? Sure. It's just one way of kind of fine tuning what kind of a change is happening. And again, optional, it's just something that worked well for me. Okay? So if I were to look at this all together, 
in a combined format. I'd have the prefix of A121A for the class. I'd have some stuff in the middle that describes what on earth this file is, which I don't really care what you put in there. It's entirely up to you. Okay? And at the end, I would have the addition and the version so that I knew what I was, what I was talking about and, and what version of it it was. And then dot .extension would be whatever the end, um, you know, if it's a DWG for an AutoCAD file or a PSD for a Photoshop file or whatever. So a few notes about file names. Generally speaking, file names shouldn't contain spaces. Now, in OS X on the Mac or on Windows, it doesn't matter if you have a space in the file name. It makes no difference. Right? They, the, the operating systems recognize the spaces, and it's no problem. If, however, you plan on uploading your file to some kind of a website, in this class, the course website, and you have spaces in the file name, the spaces aren't read easily by a web server or a browser. And so in order to compensate for what is a space, the computer will insert some random nasty characters. So if you've ever like browsed to a PDF online and you've seen the file name and it has a bunch of weird stuff in it, it's because whoever created it put some spaces in and the computer substituted in some other characters to fill up where those spaces were. Okay? Uh, it's kind of like if you went to try to browse to a website and you put spaces in. You said digital space tool space for space architects and you hit enter. It would take you to Google searching for that text rather than the actual website. So it's just the thing that websites don't really like spaces. So it's nice to avoid the spaces. You could instead use a dash or an underscore. But again, it's up to you uh, on what you want to do. Uh, file names should not use any other special characters. So you want to avoid things like forward slashes, question marks, and or periods. Right? Periods are a great example because they designate the point at which the operating system should look for the extension or how to open the file. So if we have period followed by PSD, Windows knows, or Mac knows, oh, I'm supposed to open this as a Photoshop file. And so let me go ahead and open Photoshop. So if we put a period in there, and we don't intend to have the period in there, it might get confused about what program it's supposed to open in. Sometimes you have a file that says, I can't open it uh, because I don't know what I'm supposed to open it with. Okay. So then we move forward into the idea of backing up their data, or your data. How many people actively back up their stuff right now? It's always amazing to me to ask that question because I only get like four or five hands raised out of a class of 30. This morning I had three, so that was 10% of the people backed up their data. Okay, If you're the other 80% in this class, there was more. Maybe there was six, seven, eight, so 20%, something like that. If you're the 80% that doesn't back up your data, you should be very, very scared. Okay, Because stuff happens to your files. Stuff dies, computers die, you lose stuff. So how do you back up that data? So I have a philosophy about how I back up my data. It's not something I came up with. It's not something I invented. Um, it's, it comes from a guild of multimedia artists based in San Francisco called the Pixel Core. And they talk about how they back up their files so as not to lose their information. And they use a 3 to one backup principle. Three copies of your files. Right? You always have one primary working copy. It's the copy that you actively are working on. It's probably the copy that's sitting on your flash drive that you're, that you're drawing with. Okay? You have two backup copies that have to exist somewhere in relation to that file. Okay? So three total copies. It should be on two different medium. So if you have it on your flash drive, for example, you should have another one on your hard drive, or maybe you have another one in the cloud. Right? So it's some, some different type of medium. Right? Flash drive, hard drive, different. Right? In the old days, you'd burn it to like a disk or something like that. But nobody carries disks, and nobody even has disks anymore. So whatever. Right? That's kind of antiquated and old. So chances are it's going to be a flash drive and a hard drive, in all likelihood. Okay? And you could get into the technicalities about a lot of the modern computers don't have moving hard drives anymore. They just have built-in flash memory and whatever. You get the idea. Two different places, two different mediums. Okay? Any media can fail. And that's really important to, to recognize and to kind of internalize. We talked in the first day uh, about people losing their flash drives or having their flash drives go through the wash or those kinds of things. Right? That's a good example of having a media fail. Right? In the old days of a CD or you know, like a DVD, or I could really date myself and say a laser disc, right? if you scratched it, that was basically destroying the disc. So it was sensitive to scratching. The good news is our media tends to be a little bit more forgiving now. Okay? So the point is, these can fail. You can lose things. Right? 
So the last principle, so we did three copies of our files, two different mediums, one copy off-site. And so this is where a service like Dropbox comes in or Google Drive. How many people use Dropbox or Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive or whatever? Right? Probably a lot of you use that by now. Okay? So that, that piece in and of itself is solving a lot of our problems. It's taking one piece away from us that's out, uh, you know, if something were to happen to somebody stole our laptop, right? Somebody stole our flash drive, um, our house burned down, something like that. It would take one copy away from us and keep it safe. Okay? So Dropbox is great. So you say, wait a minute, I'm in the ET lab, and these computers, if they power down, I lose everything, right? Because we can't save anything on these computers. So what do I do? Right? Well, you obviously have one copy that you're working on on your flash drive actively. That's your primary working copy. No surprise. Okay? We're going to today install Dropbox on our flash drives and use a mobile version of Dropbox that will upload up to 2 gigs or however large your, flash drive or your um, Dropbox account is of data to Dropbox. Right? You could, instead of using Dropbox, use Google Drive. Um, Google Drive is great because it gives you a little bit more space, but it's much harder to use because you manually have to copy files unless it's your home computer, in which case you can install it. So it's a little bit trickier than Dropbox, which is why I tend to be in uh, the Dropbox realm with what we're doing. So that puts one copy in the cloud. right? So we just solved the fact that we have two copies now, two of three. We have one that's off-site, and we have one that's a different medium. So we solved almost all of the riddle. So the last piece is the third copy. And so the third copy, if you install Dropbox or Google Drive or something on your home computer, your laptop, your home computer, whatever, right? by magic, through the cloud, right? we take that third copy and we stick it on your home computer. So now you have three copies, exactly as you should, two different mediums, one of which is off-site. Life is good. We solved it. So it's really not that hard to set up a system like this. And I'm going to try to help you guys set up this system today so that you don't have the big problems of, I lost my flash drive, I lost all my work, those kinds of things. Right? So we're really going to try to avoid those uh, catastrophic situations. So the other thing about backing up your files is that if it doesn't happen by itself in the background without you having to do it, you won't do it. Okay? You could start off the semester with a grand plan about every night you were going to come home and you were going to copy your, your flash drive onto your home computer when you got home. And it would last for a couple weeks, and you'd do a great job. right? And then Daniel will give you a big assignment in 121, and your English professor would give you a big paper to write, and your history professor would give you 200 pages of reading to do. And you'd walk through the door, and you'd fall flat on your face on your bed, and you'd fall asleep. And you wouldn't copy your files. Right? And then a week would go by, and you'd say, man, I really need to copy those files. But you'd have that much more to work on, that many more papers to do. And before you know it, you'd be halfway through the semester, and you wouldn't have backed up your files. Okay? It just doesn't happen. And that's normal, and it's OK. okay. But that's why it has to happen automatically in the background. That's why we need some kind of a service that does it for us. So what are our options? If we're talking about our home computers, Right? It's pretty easy because there's built-in options. If you have a Mac, you can use something called Time Machine to do this. If you have a PC, there's a Windows backup built into it. You can do it either way. You can back it up to an external hard drive. Life works out pretty well. All you have to do is be at home. Sometimes all you have to be is on your home network, and it will do it. Okay? There are other aftermarket solutions that you can use. Um, I use a program called Chronosync, even though I have a Mac and I could use Time Machine. I use this because it gives me a little bit finer control about where I put certain files. It just helps me to, to manage where those files are. You can do things like copy your entire, entire hard drive onto another hard drive, such that if one hard drive failed, you could take that new hard drive and stick it into your computer, and you would never know any different. Um, it's kind of a specialty situation, but that's what SuperDuper does. Um, there's a bunch of other ones uh, that work for PC. They're all kind of the same boat. Give you a little finer control than the built-in solutions. Okay? There are online backup solutions that we've talked about. Dropbox, I think, is a great company that's done great work. Unfortunately, they've limited how much they give you for free to two gigs, although if you do some special Easter egg hunts and stuff for them online, eventually you can get up to 20 gigs, I think, for free. Um, you can refer your friends and, and whatever. So you can gain some space, but you are limited. Um, Google, on the, all, uh, on the other hand, gives you 15 gigs for free, which is nice. Technically, it's shared with your email, but your email doesn't take up much. So generally, you have about 15 gigs to use. Um, Windows has something called OneDrive. It used to be called SkyDrive, but it's kind of the same thing as Google Drive. 
uh, in that it gives you a place to store files somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20 gigs, depending on what your account level is. Okay? So it's the same kind of thing. Both of those are free. The reason that I shy away from using Google Drive or the, the Windows SkyDrive or uh, OneDrive, excuse me, in, um, in this class is just because we can't very easily install a portable version that runs off of just your flash drive. And with Dropbox, there's an, a little aftermarket piece of software that will allow us to run Dropbox off the flash drive. If that is happening, it's backing up while you're working and life is good. So I certainly have had people uh, in my classes prefer to use Google Drive in which case they download the files that they're using and then they upload the files that they're using. Works fine, um, and that's certainly something that you can choose and elect to do. I'm going to talk you through Dropbox today, but it's, it's there. If you have your home computer, there are also backup solutions that are a little bit more exhaustive that may back up your entire computer for a given flat fee per year, uh, such that you always have a complete backup of your computer. If you're really worried about somebody else having access to your data, you can buy your own server and run your own cloud off of your own server, uh, which is another option. One cloud is a, is a piece of software that will do that for you. Um, so there are certainly options for how you choose to store your files and back up your files. Okay? So the other thing is you need these backups to occur at regular intervals. Right? In an ideal world, it would be more than nightly. It would be like hourly or minutely you'd have backups. Right? But at least if you get nightly, you're in pretty good shape. You can see where this is going, right? Probably a weekly backup would be good. This is going back in time, right? A monthly backup would be pretty good. Semester backups, I think, are something that's, that's very critical and very important to do. And that is, at the end of a particular class, take all the files related to that one class, put them together on some kind of a medium. I used to recommend you know, burn them out to a disk, but nobody burns disks anymore, and nobody has disks to do it to. So put them on a flash drive and stick them somewhere on that flash drive. The advantage of doing this kind of a, hey, my class is over. This is all the work that I ever created for this class, is that down the road, let's say you're applying to grad school, and you really had a good project while you were at DVC. Maybe your 220 project was really, really good, and you want to include that in your portfolio. Well, it's been three, four, five years, and you don't really remember where the files are or what you called them or anything else. If you have these kind of semesterly backups with a folder, and this is all I did in 220, you can go back to that folder and use that in your portfolio. Um, this may be a little self-serving. I, uh, I had a project that I did as an undergrad in Berkeley. It really was a great project. I loved it. And I went when I was going to put my portfolio together for grad school, I went back to A, find the drawings, and B, find the photos that I took of it. I couldn't find either one. I had one blurry photo. That was the only thing I could find. So I couldn't include it in my portfolio, even though it was a pretty good project. And I wanted to include it. So it's just one of those things that if you back it up now, you'll save yourself time um, and a hassle later on. So then it obviously goes to yearly. You get the idea. So the other thing is, are there things that are digital that are of such importance level that you would really, really be sad if they got lost? Okay? And so certainly, I'm not presumptuous enough to think that your coursework for Architecture 135 is of that level. Okay? However, there may be things in your life that are that important. Okay? I have photos of the birth of my daughter. I have photos of the birth of my son. If I were to lose those altogether, that would be catastrophic in my life. I would be really, really upset having lost those. Okay? Now, I do have wedding photos too, but I could probably survive without those. Don't tell my wife, right? No, I am, I'm kidding. The point is that there are some things that are really, really important to me that I wouldn't want to lose. And so this may be taking it to an extreme, but what I do with those things that are that important to me is I put those photos on a hard drive, and I only do this about once a year because it is a total hassle, okay? I used to put them on CDs, but it ended up taking like 50-something CDs or 50 DVDs to do it, so it was just too much. I put them on a hard drive, and I go to my bank, and I put that hard drive in my safety deposit box. Okay? Sounds completely ridiculous, but I know that those are safe. I know that they're off-site. I know that nobody can touch them. Right? Nobody's touching the drive. Nothing's going to happen. They're sitting there. Now, unfortunately, the bank robbers that try to rob my safety deposit box are going to be thoroughly disappointed because all they're going to get is a hard drive. There's no gold bars. There's nothing good in there, right? just a hard drive. But I know that those photos that are that precious to me are going to be safe. Right? So I'll tell you another example to cause you to think about this a little bit. Okay? And, and probably one of you or more than one of you could give me an example of where this kind of thing might have happened to you or somebody you care about. 
So um, when my wife was in high school, she grew up in the Central Valley. She was, uh, she was out of the country with her mom, and she got a call from her stepdad. And her stepdad said, um, you know, Aaron, my wife's name, I just, I just found out that the levee's going to break. And it's either going to break on our side, or it's going to break on the Marysville side, and it's going to flood either our house or, you know, the other side of the levee's houses. And I don't know which one. They're giving us an hour to evacuate. What do you want from your room? Think about that. What do you want? Right? Now, of course, she was in high school. The most important thing she could possibly think of were her yearbooks. Right? Now, looking back on it, it's like, really? That's what you picked? But the point is, if you use something like that and you internalize something like that, and you really think about what is it that is so valuable to you in your life, and you protect that, whatever that thing is. Right? So I tell you these ridiculous stories to make you actually think about it. Is there anything in your digital world that is that important? And what are you actively doing to protect that? Right? So think about it. Maybe you don't have to be as extreme as me, but at least it's, it's an example, and it'll get you thinking about it. So let's shift gears all together, and let's talk a little bit about calendars. How many people keep a calendar regularly? Thank you. I asked that question this morning, and either everybody was asleep, or I was just like baffled. There were like three people that raised their hand. Right? I'm guessing that in school, you probably need to keep a calendar, and I think it's a good idea to keep a calendar. The question is, how well organized is it? And is there any way that you can make your calendar more accurate and easier to keep? Right? So one of the things that I offer for you in this class is the ability to subscribe to the calendar for this course. Right? And some of you that were in my other course know that I offer this up for any of my courses. Uh, we'll walk through how you actually do it uh, in a little bit. But calendars, um, generally, you're going to keep a separate calendar for your work, your school, and maybe your personal life. Right? In this, in this realm, maybe you're only keeping one for school, but at least you have one for school. Okay? Um, whenever it's possible, if you can subscribe to a calendar, all the better. That's why I give you that option here. Because if I change the assignments, there you go. It's already on your calendar. You can just look at your calendar. You know the most current, up-to-date information about when something is due, when something is handed out. You even know what I'm going to lecture on in a given day. Right? So you can be prepared for that sort of thing. Hopefully, some of your other teachers offer the same thing. Right? But obviously, I don't control them. Uh, but the idea is subscribing is great. If you're really interested in a sports team, for example, if you subscribe to their calendar, you know when their games are scheduled, which is a good strategy. Okay? If your calendars are able to sync to the devices that you use, all the better. Some people use paper calendars. Anybody use paper calendars here? Right? Some people believe in those, and they use them, and it works great for them. Hey, no problem. Right? Other people like digital-based calendars. Certainly, we're all starting to carry smartphones now. So it's kind of natural that we'd have a calendar on our phone, and that would keep us in the loop and remind us of things that we needed to do and, and that sort of thing. Um, so all the better. If you can sync your phone to your computer, to your iPad, to whatever, right? that's the ideal world. So everything um, goes across multiple platforms. So there are a variety of web-based calendars that we'll talk about today. Uh, most people have a Gmail account, which means you have a Google Calendar account. Um, you may have Yahoo Mail, in which case you have a Yahoo Calendar. You may have Outlook. If you have Outlook, well, you have an Outlook calendar. right? And you could subscribe to any one of these calendar feeds in any one of those calendars. So it's kind of a universal format, which is good. Um, Sunrise Calendar is an iOS or Android-based calendar for your phone. Um, the, the only reason that I put it in here um, is because once you sync it to your, um, your calendar accounts, it'll send you an email every morning, first thing in the morning. And it'll say, hey, this is what you have going on today. Right? It's something that I use just as a reminder of, hey, don't forget about this stuff. So it's a nice service. It's there as an option. right? iCloud is obviously the, uh, the Mac version and the iOS version of a calendar. So it's not like you've never seen a calendar before, right? but this is an example of what a Google Calendar looks like with some subscriptions. Obviously, this is old, January 2014. Um, but it, you can see that there's subscriptions to my 135 class and my 136 class right? listed. Same thing in a Yahoo Calendar, or this is an Outlook Calendar, sorry. Um, same, same basic idea, right? Lectures, labs, all listed. Right? There's our Yahoo calendar, essentially the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about email as we move from calendars into email. So the average person has three email accounts. How many people have at least three email accounts? Right? Most of you have at least three email accounts, so we fit within the world of average. Right? Generally speaking, it's one for your friends and your family. It's one for your work or your school. 
or maybe one for work and one for school. Certainly you all have an insight email that you probably never ever check. Um, hopefully we'll rectify that situation slightly today. And you generally have some kind of a spam trash account that you opened when you were like 16 and you didn't really realize what email was, right? So the number of emails sent by humanity each day is approaching or now over 200 billion emails. That's a lot of emails, right? The average person receives 121 emails a day, right? How many people feel like they're on average or above that number? Well, that's good. You guys don't get many. I'm way above that number, right? I probably get 500 a day. Easy, right? Part of the problem there is that um, the DVC faculty somehow have this idea that replying to all is a great thing. And so there's all this complete junk email that comes in through my DVC account. I probably get 300 a day just from DVC. It's absurd. Anyway, so what do we do about it? If we want to simplify and declutter our email accounts, one of the great things to do is to think about what account you want to use primarily and forward those other peripheral accounts into that one account. Right? It's a way of consolidating your email. You just get them in one account. It can be useful. So there are ways of forwarding your email. You want to decide which email address or addresses you want to use. Right? One of the things that's important here is if you had that email account that you opened up um, you know, when you were 16 and it was you know, sexyhotman123 at yahoo.com, as you go forward in your life, that's not my email. But as you go forward in your life and you're applying for a job, right, a professional internship, and they ask you what your email is, you probably don't want to give them sexyhotman123 at yahoo.com. Right? You probably want something like you know, grantadams at gmail.com or something reasonably professional. Right? So as you get older and as you get more and more professional and you get into that world, you kind of want to have something that is a very professional, easy to remember, identifiable email. And we'll talk about that as part of branding yourself a little bit later in this class. The other thing is to enable any spam filters that are available, which is great. Right, because it helps cull out the, the stuff that you don't really want to see. Right? You don't need Viagra advertisements and all the rest of the junk. Right? That can all go straight to the junk mail. Okay? Um, you can also unsubscribe from emails, because as soon as marketing companies get your email, they just love to send you stuff. Right? Now, does unsubscribing really work? Maybe, maybe not. Right? It does from some companies, maybe. Right? But at least you can try. It won't hurt to try. Okay? So if we were going to forward a Gmail account, uh, you would go into your settings, and you'd go to your forwarding and pop IMAP settings, and there's a little radio button right here to say forward a copy to a particular account. Pretty easy to do. Takes a little bit um, of uh, verification so that you can't forward it to an email that you don't actually own. You have to say, you know, it sends you an email, yes, I own this, and it's okay to forward it. Um, if you wanted to do it in Outlook, it's essentially the same thing. You go into your options, and you go into forwarding, and you say, I want to forward it. Right? So this is an example of my DVC email. So if you send it to G Adams at DVC, it gets forwarded automatically to my grant at Digital Tools. Um, so just a way of kind of decluttering. Okay? Um, also, if you can use an email client that helps you get through your emails faster, all the better. And so I used to recommend this really great program called Mailbox uh, that, that lets you get through your emails really fast. Unfortunately, they got bought by Dropbox, and as of a month ago, Dropbox decided they didn't want to make it anymore, so they killed it, right? Which was like I wasted five years of my life in this email program, and now I didn't know what to do. Um, so I've been struggling, but I found a program called Spark that's kind of close, kind of similar, uh, helps organize your email and get you through it faster, um, which is nice. So you're welcome to try it out. The problem is it doesn't come with uh, a desktop version, which is the one thing I don't like. Another thing that might be useful to you is a, is a product called Google Voice. It's free from Google. Um, and basically what you can get is a phone number that's unique to you that will be yours for the rest of your life, assuming you want to keep it. Um, you can choose whatever that number is, which is also nice. And it will allow you to forward calls and text messages to your cell phone without having to give people your actual cell phone. Right? So I gave you all my phone, right? but it was my Google Voice number. So it's a way of controlling. So you don't have unlimited access to me. All right? It can control how the, the texts come in, how the messages come in. I can forward it to my cell phone. I can forward it to my house phone. If I went out of town, I could forward it to wherever I went. If I went someplace where there wasn't cell reception, for example, I could forward it to a landline, all for free, which is certainly a nice feature. The other thing that they'll do is they'll transcribe any voicemail. So if you left me a message, 
right? It would transcribe it into text and send me an email or send me a text with the transcription. So I wouldn't actually have to listen to you talk. I could just read what you said. It's reasonably accurate. Sometimes it's kind of humorous where it gets messed up, right? You can also set up custom greetings. So if my wife called, I could say something different on the answering machine than if, if somebody else called. OK, so let's move a little bit more into the online world. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about websites a little bit. We'll talk about personal landing pages and kind of how do you brand your online identity as we move forward. And so um, when you start to do this, we have to start kind of at the basic level um, in an understanding of how the internet works. Okay? The internet uses something called the DNS system, the domain name system, that translates a name into an internet routing number, essentially, that tells you or tells the browser where to go to find the information. So if, for example, you typed in digitaltoolsforarchitects.com and you hit enter, right? there needs to be some kind of a system that translates digitaltoolsforarchitects.com into the server address, which happens to be 162.220.8.188. Now, if I had you all remember 162.220.8.188, it would be really annoying. right? Instead, Digital Tools for Architect. Oh, that's easy. I can type that in. Right? So the domain name system makes it easy for us to get access to the internet. In order to get this access, right, we need to use some kind of a web browser. And this is kind of second nature to us by now. We do almost everything in a browser. Um, internet Explorer is what comes standard on a, on a PC. I will freely admit it is not my favorite browser, uh, but it is there. Um, Safari is what comes standard on a Mac. It's not bad, right? Firefox is reasonably OK. It's available for everything. And Google Chrome uh, is another browser that I think is one of the better ones that's offered, right? Again, it's my personal opinion. It is built on a technology called WebKit, which is the fastest of the browsers, um, which is pretty good. And then there is this other one called Opera, but I don't even know if you've even heard of it, right? But it does exist. So. Things to consider when we're talking about browsers and, and accessing the internet is, of course, if you browse to a site that has malicious activity, it may try to install stuff on your computer. In the old days, it would just do it. Now, at least it pops up some stuff saying, are you sure you want to install this? Right? And so you want to be aware that you do you, in fact, trust the site that you're downloading from or, or whatever. So be aware of that. Um, and then obviously, how fast is the browser? Does it have any extensions like that block ads or any of that kind of stuff? They all basically do that stuff now. So let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi. And I would bet that a lot of you have laptops, and I would bet that a lot of you connect to the DVC network when you get here, the DVC Wi-Fi. Okay? The truth of it is that the DVC Wi-Fi is not a secure network. Right? So if you're at home, and you have a password-protected router, and you're sitting in your home, Right? Sharing files with your roommate is not a bad thing. Right? Maybe you have you know, the latest episode of The Walking Dead, and you want somebody else to watch it, and you just kind of push it over to them. Right? I'm not commenting in, on any of the legalities of any of that. I'm just using this as an example. Of course, I would never do something like that. If, <laughs> if, if you did that, it would be fine. No big deal. Okay? It's with your roommate. Now, let's say you come to DVC, and you still have that file available to share, and you connect to the DVC network. Right? Well, guess what? There's a bunch of other people who are also connected to the DVC network. And if you leave your computer open, right, they can see those files. They can put nasty files on your computer and vice versa. Right? Bad news. It's unsecure. So you want to be aware when you go to a place like that. Right? That's the biggest thing is being aware. So if you connect to the DVC Wi-Fi, probably not a good idea to leave your file sharing open. Right? Probably not a good idea to leave your screen sharing open. Right? So you want to close that stuff down when you're on, a pre, uh, on a, um, an unsecure network. So the other thing that people can do, and this is, of course, malicious people, and they're probably few and far between, but they can exist, so it's worth pointing them out, is that if you're browsing and you're not browsing to a secure site, and by a secure site I mean like you go to a bank and the little lock appears, right, or it turns green. You guys have seen this. right? You go to Amazon, it turns green in the bar. If you're not going to one of those kind of sites, Technically speaking, somebody that was doing packet sniffing or whatever could intercept and read whatever it is that you're typing. Right? So it's worth being aware that if somebody was malicious on a network like this, they could get information. Right? So any SSL connections, bank connections, that kind of stuff you don't have to worry about. 
So one of the other things is that people love to leave the default Wi-Fi username, password, et cetera, right? You get your Wi-Fi router from Comcast. Do you change it? No, it's just the defaults, right? Which is normal, except that somebody at Comcast knows what your password is, right? So theoretically, right, with a little bit of hacking or a little bit of leaking or whatever, somebody could get the passwords and get into any one of those home networks. So it's always a good idea to change it out of the defaults into your own custom password and make sure that your home network is secure because that's where you tend to do file sharing and there's reasonable uses for that. Um, maybe it's just backing up your, your uh, data onto an external hard drive or something and you do that on your home network, right? Most modern encryption is called WPA um, and they're bumping up the levels of encryption. Uh, generally, it's more secure than the older WEP which is very much crackable. Um, so it's worth being aware that you want the highest level encryption you can get, okay? So sometimes, right, you might want a little bit of added security. And you can do this by signing up for a virtual private network or a VPN. And there are companies that offer this as a service to you. And essentially what it does is it allows you, let's say I'm here at DVC, and I don't want anybody to be able to see anything that I'm doing on my computer, right? But I'm on the public Wi-Fi. If I connect to my VPN, I establish an encrypted connection directly to this company, right? And then from that company, I then go out to the internet at large. So anything that's happening where somebody was trying to look at me at DVC or what I was doing, right, they can't see it because it's encrypted, it's blocked, right? But my traffic goes through and out through the company. So another use for this might be, uh, let's say you wanted to watch the Warriors, right, using like an NBA league pass or something like that, and you were here in the Bay Area, and they blocked you, right? Anybody had this kind of a thing happen? It might work for Major League Baseball, same thing, right? Maybe you don't watch sports, but the, the idea is certainly there, right? If you shift your geographic location, let's say I was in New York, I could watch it, okay? So using a VPN like this, you can geographically switch where you're coming out of the encrypted network. So I can switch from being here in California to being in New York, or being in Singapore, or being in Italy, right? Wherever I want to be, I can come out through that location and then access whatever it is that I want. In the old days, um, Spotify wasn't in the US, it was only in the UK, and if you wanted to use Spotify and you were in the US, you had to have one of these virtual private networks to pretend to come out of the UK to be able to access that particular service. So it's something that can allow you to do these geographic shiftings, okay? Very much a legal thing, this is not, I'm not spouting anything about, um, illegality, okay? There are a variety of companies that offer this. Private internet access is one, um, but there's a bunch of other ones and, and you can certainly look it up if you want to. Here's the graphic that kind of explains it. Without private internet access, if you were going out to the web, somebody could potentially see your web traffic, right, which are represented by the ones and zeros. If instead you have something with this VPN, you have an encrypted connection to the private internet access company, it's encrypted from there to there, and then it's anonymous from there out. Certainly something to be aware of. So let's talk a little bit about passwords, okay? Russian hackers now have at least 1.2 billion clear text passwords, right? I wonder if one of your passwords is one of those, right? That's a lot of passwords. The average internet user has 27 accounts and only six and a half passwords. How many people use the same password for multiple accounts? Right. Most of you would probably raise your hand on that, right? So most normal passwords, like a name and a year or something like that, can be cracked in about 90 seconds, right? Not particularly hard. So one in 10 passwords, one in 10 passwords is a name and a year. Anybody fall into that category? Nobody wants to admit it, okay? Two in a thousand passwords is the word password. It's kind of scary, right? Love is the most common verb in a password. It's 12 times more likely than hate in a password, okay? The most popular adjectives in a password are sexy, hot, and pink. <laughs> kind of entertaining, right? So maybe these fall under passwords that you, knew, you use, maybe not, okay? So the faster pass computers are getting, the faster it is to crack a password, right? And the easier it is to crack a password. So um, most of the password cracking, uh, there are conferences where people come together to do this kind of stuff. Um, to try to prove security vulnerabilities. Um, the, the world of internet security is ridiculously insecure 
and people are trying to raise awareness of this and, and, and get people to, to change how they're working. So anyway, there have been studies done. Uh, generally, the fastest way of doing it is with a graphics card processor rather than a, a central processor on a computer. So in this example, a PC with an AMD Radon graphics card can try on average 8.2 billion password combinations per second. Right? That's a lot of passwords per second that it can try. Okay? The more passwords that are leaked and or discovered, so you guys have heard of like, oh, LinkedIn got hacked and it's, they lost a bunch of passwords. Or Target got hacked and they, they lost a bunch of passwords. Or Amazon got, right? You, you've heard this in the news over and over and over again. Well, every time one of those happens, right? sure, maybe the hackers didn't actually get any of your personal information, but they got the clear text version of your password. Okay? So once they have the clear text version of their password, if I was a hacker and I was trying to hack into your account, what would I use first? Would I start with a password that was just completely random letters? No, I would use all those billions of passwords that are already clear text to see if one of them was yours. Right? It's more likely that it's that than some random string of numbers. So instead of going about it in a mathematical way, I would go about it with the most logical things first. So I'd use those passwords. So the more passwords that are leaked, the smarter the people are that are trying to crack your password. They'll use those first. Okay? So in this particular example, this is a $12,000 computer. This is, again, in one of those black hat conferences trying to, to prove how fast things could hack. Um, this particular computer, it took it 12 hours to hack a completely random eight-character string. It's only 12 hours. Right? Kind of scary. So the other thing is that tricks don't really work any, anymore. We used to try to get fancy and say, oh, I'm going to do one of these tricks and my passwords are going to be really secure. So maybe we'd write a password called mustache and then we'd spell mustache backwards. Right? Now, that would never work for me because I can't spell mustache forwards or backwards. Right? But the point is that you could do a word forwards and backwards. That doesn't work. We, they know that, that you would do something like that. The other thing that people love to do is substitutions. Right? Let's take all the E's and make them threes. Well, guess what? People have done that, and so they're going to do it. Right? How about making first letters capitals of words? Yeah, they've tried that. Right? Um, and you can see adding periods or exclamation points, right? pretty common. Okay? So any combination of these sorts of things doesn't really work. Right? So OMG, I'm in trouble. Maybe slightly more than that. Right? What do I use? What, how, do I, how do I make myself secure? Well, the trick is. You can't use the same password twice, right? which is really annoying. But we'll get to that in a second. The other thing is that your passwords shouldn't contain words at all. They should be completely random strings of numbers, letters, and symbols, and weird things that you can barely find on the keyboard. That's the ideal world. right? Capitals, lowercase letters, all of that combined together. Okay? The more random your password is, the harder it is to crack. The longer it is, the more random it is, the harder it is to crack. So what do you do? Right? Well, there's no way for me to remember, let's say I had the average user accounts of 27, there's no way for me to remember 27 random strings of numbers that are 14 characters long. Can't do it. Brain meltdown. Not going to happen. Okay? So what do I do? You're going to have to use some kind of a password manager. All right? now, this is an application that runs that does this specifically for a specific purpose. Now, at this point in your careers as students or life, people, right? you may or may not feel that this is necessary. There will come a point in your, in your life where you'll think back on this lecture. Well, maybe you won't think back on this lecture. But you'll come to a point in your life where you will say, you know what, I do need more secure passwords. And you'll start using a system like this. And it will happen at some point. right? And I can promise you that um, as we do more and more um, problems with security. So you use a, a password manager. The one I use is 1Password. All of these are great. Um, in an ideal world, one of these password managers, it looks something like this when you're running it on your computer. It will encrypt your passwords behind a master password. So essentially, you're going to be asked to remember one completely random string of numbers, right? which takes a while to get used to. But once you get that one random string of numbers memorized, that's the only one that you have to do. Don't tell anybody that random string. And if it's purely a random string, you're in good shape. Okay? So the one I have is, uh, that I use is, I think it's about 14 characters long, 15 characters, something like that. Completely random string of numbers and letters and symbols. Okay? So that's what I use as my master password. That protects the whole vault of passwords. But after that, right, it integrates to my operating system on my computer. It integrates to my phone. It integrates to my iPad. And all I need to know is either 
that master password or use the thumbprint on my phone to get access to it. Right? And when I go to a, a site that needs a login, I just open it up and it fills in information for me. So it'll fill in my username and it'll fill in whatever the random string of password is that is probably 14 characters that are random. I don't even know what they are half the time and it doesn't matter. Right? It will generate those passwords when you're first signing up so that it's completely secure random string of passwords and then you don't have to remember it. So there is one caveat and that is that if I were on a computer that I didn't own, the, the digital tool or these computers in the lab is a good example, I'd have to get out my phone or get out my uh, computer and I'd have to look at the clear text version of my password that is a random string of numbers and I'd have to sit there and type it in. Okay? So it's a little bit annoying for um, and I'll do this a little bit later when I sign into Dropbox. I have to look it up and I have to type in that 14 weird characters. Okay? So in that case, it's a little annoying, but I would much rather have the peace of mind and the security in, the, in my life and sacrifice that extra 30, 45 seconds that it takes me to type it in on the off chance that I need to log in a computer that's not mine. Okay? So it's really not that bad, but certainly something to be aware of. Right? When I get to my banking accounts and stuff, I increase the length of the characters. I might be up to 28, 30 characters. Really, really hard to brute force 28 or 30 random characters, completely random. Right? So that's what I do to secure myself. Okay? The other thing that you can do, and a lot of banks do this now, you probably experienced this before. You try to log into your bank and they say, oh wait, I don't recognize your computer. I'm going to send you a text message or I'm going to give you a phone call with a special code. That's a way of verifying it's you. So somebody trying to log in would have to also have your phone to be able to gain access. It's called two-factor authentication. It's yet again another step that makes things more secure. If you want more information, here's a couple articles. Um, you can go back and click the links on the, on the digital tools site um, that you can read more about this. If you do a Google search for passwords and, and that sort of thing, you'll, you can read a bunch of articles uh, about it. OK, so let's move again into branding yourself. And as I said, today I'm going a little bit longer uh, than as usual, but I think it's important to get through a lot, of, uh, a lot of this information. So when we talk about branding yourself, this has to do with creating and managing an online identity. Okay? So if you're not actively controlling how the world, how the internet sees you, right, you don't have any control over it. Right? If you're not actively trying to do it, Google will determine it for you. Right? Yahoo search will determine it for you. Well, maybe they won't. Google will probably determine it for you. Okay? So I'm going to have you all do something. Look at your computers right now and Google yourself. How many people have done this? Right? A few of you? Good for you. I'm giving you permission to be total, totally uh, vanity search for yourself. So it's kind of entertaining. So guess what? Apparently I died in a freak sunbed accident. I was tanning and I died. Okay, well, guess what? I'm here, I'm alive, it wasn't me. But that's the top result that comes up when you search my name. Okay? So Google determines what happens when you search your own name. And I can promise you that when you go to apply for a job down the road, the first thing that a company is going to do is they're going to Google you and see if they can find you. Okay? Now, if you search for Grant Adams and then architecture, you will find me. Okay? So sometimes you need a little bit of extra. But if you're not actively branding yourself, you just want to be aware of this. Right? It turned out for a long time I was a dating guru. And I'm kind of bummed that I died in a freak sunbed accident because I would rather be the dating guru than dead. But anyway, the point is that it's, it's not really me. And if I don't actively manage that, that's a problem. So how do we do this? How do we manage ourselves? How do we let Google know who we are? Okay? So one thing that we could do is we could start a website. We could buy a domain name that represents us. I could buy grantadams.net, and I could put stuff related to me on that website. I could let Google crawl it and establish my identity that way. Now, this is a little bit more involved to do something like this. It costs a little bit of money. It costs a little bit of time on my end. But it's something that I could certainly do. Okay? It costs about $12 a year plus the hosting fees of a website to host it. right? The nice thing about that is you're not subject to some website or company going out of business or deciding to charge for a service that was once free. Um, but I'm not going to have you do that in class. I'm going to have you do it using a service. Okay? The other thing is you have to give it a name. So if you were choosing a domain name, you'd have to come up with grantadams.net or something along those lines. Right? Um, if it is something kind of creative, you could get a really long domain name. To me, Digital Tools for Architects is way too long. It's too much typing to get through each character. Right? 
So if I could have gotten DTFA.org or something like that, I would have bought that. But somebody already bought it. So we're stuck with digital tools for architects, right? The point is you want to be careful. You also have the option to change what the extension is. There's now a bunch of extra stuff that you can add on at the end of your domain name instead of .com. Um, some cost more, some cost less. Some are cute, um, some are not so cute, uh, depending on how they, you spell and where you put the periods. Um, it ends up being a little bit too much um, a lot of times. So if you stick with .com, .net, you're generally in pretty good shape. Okay? If you're interested in doing something like this, pull it up in Google, try to type in the address and see if, in fact, it exists. Somebody already owns it. A lot of times people own it. Um, and obviously consider your own name if you can. If you were going to actually go through with this, and again, this is just food for thought. It's not something we're actively going to do in this class. But you would go to a registrar's website. You'd search for that desired name. If it was available, you'd, you'd basically rent it. I say buy it, but you rent it for a year. And then you can choose to renew it and rent it again. And it's about 10, 12 bucks a year. Right? Then you would have to have a host or a server or something to host up the information. Uh, and then you could have an actual website. These are the registrars that are out there. Um, Namecheap happens to be the one I use. Um, it's the cheapest, so why not? So what we're actually going to do today, instead of creating your own website from scratch, we're going to develop something called a personal landing page. And this is a page that's really designed for you to control and to be a place where all of the stuff that you do online ends up in one place. Right? It's a way of branding yourself. This is me, and this is the stuff that I do. Right? It comes into one clean page. We're going to use uh, a company called flavors.me to do this. Um, the company is great because they're very graphic based. You can set up a really nice looking website relatively easily. Um, and it'll let you actively manage your online identity. It'll let you claim projects and sites that belong to you. You can link to your own sites. And you can basically control how the internet sees you. So rather than relying on an employer to search Google and find you, you could give the employer, hey, grantadams.flavors.me, this is a website that represents me, this is all the stuff that I do, right? And they can look at it and get a lot of information about you. So like I said, flavors.me is what we're using. You could use something like Google Plus or Facebook for that. The problem with um, some of the social media sites like Facebook um, is that you end up with like your, your random aunt and uncle that are friends with you that like constantly post things and smiley faces on your page and whatever. And that might not be what you're really going for in a professional setting. So something like a personal landing page really divorces you from that kind of connection to family and friends and all that stuff and lets you really brand you as you, right? And, and detaches you from everything else. So these are some examples based on the flavors.me page um, that you can kind of see. I'll just run through several examples. And you can see that based on the same general formatting, right, you can really quickly get your own personal agenda or ideas across. Right? What is it that represents you, and how do you, how do you create this kind of a page? Right? And different people have different takes on what's important and what do they want to show. And you'll have the opportunity to do the same kind of thing today. Right? So the other thing is you need to, once you have a personal landing page, you need to be able to get your name out there so that Google will associate you, your name, with your landing page and start to make that connection. And the way that happens is by cross-linking. Right? So stuff that you post on one site has that link in it. Google starts to follow the links and say, oh, you're associated with this. Right? Um, so what we're going to do today um, is we're going to make your flavors.me attached to your Digital Tools for Architects account and vice versa, such that when you make posts on the Digital Tools for Architects page, right, it will automatically, when Google crawls the page, associate your name, your content with your flavors.me page. Okay? So we're going to update our site-specific links, uh, and then we're going to continue to post comments and post content as we normally would. And lo and behold, over time, Google will start to develop that connection. Right? So a couple notes about privacy here, because I can't resist telling you. Um, all too often, we post things on, say, Facebook, pictures, whatever, that really probably shouldn't be posted. And the problem is, once they're posted, they're permanently not in your control anymore. And so you want to be very careful about the things that you choose to post. And I'm going to tell you guys this, and it may not sink in for years, but some of you it might sink in already. 
because that embarrassing post of you when you were drunk, covered in boxes on the floor, right, is probably not the thing that you want your potential employer to see in five years. Right? When you post it right now, it's really funny, and you and your buddies can laugh about it. Right? But that stuff sticks around, and it's really hard to get rid of once it's posted online. And so I caution you, either be very tight with who your friends are in your Facebook circle and keep that as a very private thing, or be very careful about what you actually post to these kinds of social media sites. The other thing that's worth reading is what are the terms of service, and at what point does Facebook or whatever company you post to gain ownership of the stuff that you post? Right? You post a picture. If their terms of service say they own the picture now, they can do what they want with the picture, and you don't have control of that anymore. So it's really something to be very cautious of in this day and age, because all too often we're too casual with the kinds of things we post. Okay? So I'm not trying to depress you or give you the doom and gloom speech. I would just like you to be aware that that kind of stuff is hard to retract once it's posted. Okay? What else can you do if you own a domain name? You could set up site-specific email, grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, for example. Right? Instead of grant at, at uh, gmail.com, it can be a more professional way of doing it. Um, again, that requires a little bit of setup and, and a little bit of money to be pushed out. Um, you could set it up through Google Apps. You could set it up for free through a company called Zoho. Um, if it's something you're really interested in, of co course, I'd be happy to help you through it. Uh, it gives you access to all the Google Apps and the same, same stuff. So you want to transition from being just a user to a content creator. Right? When you create content and you post stuff, when you make comments, as long as it's associated with your personal landing page and your online identity, that helps build who you are in Google. Right? And so as long as you set that up, you, all you should have to do is just do what you normally do online, and it'll start to, to fall naturally into place. So one other thing that I want to point out for today, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on that, I'm not a huge fan of most social networks. However, I think LinkedIn is something that is, is definitely going to be around to stay. Um, this has to do with a professional um, resume of yourself. Um, it's great for future employers. It's something that if you start to cultivate now, it will help you down the road. Um, whether you choose to use it and connect to a bunch of your friends or not is really up to you. But when you go to apply for a job, it's going to be something that you'll use as part of your resume or part of your package. So I'm going to encourage you to spend about 30 minutes today and work on a LinkedIn profile. How many people already have a LinkedIn profile? Few of you, that's good. For you guys, you're, you're most of the way there when it comes to LinkedIn. If you don't have one, I would encourage you to create one. And this is another thing that you will use as a cross-branding technique. So we'll add this to your, your posts. You'll have a link to that when you create a post. And it will sell, help, again, associate who you are with the stuff that you create in a professional context. Okay? So this is an example of mine. And I'll show you the live page in a little bit, a little bit later. But it says who I am and what do I do. It shows where I work from, right? what the kinds of things that I do. It's basically it's an online resume. Uh, and if you keep it updated, it's, it's a pretty good way of, of summarizing who and what you are. Okay? So we're going to take a little break. I apologize again that I went over a little bit today. Uh, we'll take a break for about, uh, I don't know, 13 minutes. We'll come back at 7.30. Right? And we'll start on the exercise. And I'll walk you through the various parts of the exercise. I know that there are lots of different parts, most of which are really quick. right? And so you'll jump through. Are there any questions? No? All right. I'll see you in uh, uh, 13 minutes or so. OK, so I'm going to start um, walking you through the various steps of exercise 102 and demonstrating some but not all of the pieces. Um, the truth is that there isn't a specific order in which you need to do these, um, so we can jump around a bit um, through them. I'm going to emphasize part one. Um, we'll talk a little bit about t part two. Part three is truly optional. Um, it's, if you want to consolidate your emails, you're welcome to. If not, it's not a big deal. Um, part four is the LinkedIn profile, which is really something that you guys can do uh, by yourself as, as these other things are happening. Uh, and then part five is something that I'll come back to and spend some more time really walking through after we get a little bit further on down the road. So I want to start with part one, which is the uh, letting, letting us install a component on our flash drive that will run Dropbox and create a Dropbox folder for us. Um, the advantage of this, while it does take one caveat, and that is that you actually have to start the program for it to, to be backing up your data, it does allow us to do something automatically in the background while we're working on our school computers. Um, so Dropbox, the company, doesn't actually support a 
portable or mobile version of their software. They designed it just to work on the desktop. Uh, but it's in enough demand that there is somebody who has written a piece of software that will adapt the regular Dropbox installation to work on a flash drive or an external hard drive. So I've gone ahead and I've plugged in my external hard drive to the computer that I'm working on. And I need to now install that, um, this piece of software on my flash drive. And so I've gone to the digital tools site. I'm logged in. You can see the black bar at the top, meaning that I'm logged in. Once I've done that, I've gone to tutorials, digital life 0 0.3. Um, 0 0.2 is for older flash drives. I, I doubt that anybody has the U3 system on their flash drives anymore anyway. Um, so most people are going to want 0 0.3, which is Dropbox Portable. Um, this opens up the tutorial that walks us through what we're going to be doing. I'm going to go ahead and skip to step two and open the link to the software. Uh, this is the person who develops this, this portable version of the software, uh, which shows up here. If we click on the Download Now button, it will actually take us to a link that says, um, I have a beta version that's available. Um, so if you click where it says beta v1.6.8.9, that's the one we're going to end up picking which will then take us to a Google Groups page where we can download Dropbox Portable AHK version 1.6.8.9 beta, okay, which is the version we want. So I'll go ahead and click on that. And this will then download a 3 plus megabyte zip file that contains this Dropbox Portable information um, for us to use. And so once it's downloaded, there we go, uh, it is by default a zip file. So if I click the little triangle, and I know this is always hard because it's behind my head when I'm, when I'm demonstrating here. If I click the little triangle next to the, the file that downloaded, I can click on Show in Folder. And when I do that, we can see the file here, and it has the little zipper icon on it, which means it's a compressed file. So they've taken a bunch of files, put them together, compressed them so that it doesn't take as much to download them. Uh, so in order to use it, I actually need to extract it. Um, from its file. So I'm going to right click on the file and I'm going to say extract all. And then I'm going to put it in my flash drive. And so right now the C drive isn't my flash drive, so I'm going to click on the browse button here. And I'm going to go to computer and then my flash drive is right here, it's the E drive. Now I'd like to take it one step further and I'm going to put it inside a folder called portable applications. If you don't have a portable application folder, you can click on the Make New Folder and make one. Right? It's optional, but I like to keep my flash drive a little bit organized, so putting it in a, a folder called Portable Application seems like a, a nice place to put it. So I'll go ahead and say OK, and then I'll click the Extract button, and it will go through the extraction process for me. So now that it's done with the extraction process, it opens a window, and I can see that here's my flash drive. Here's my portable applications folder, and inside of that is a folder called Dropbox Portable AHK. And so I'll double click on that, and inside of that folder, there's an application. We can see as type, it's an application that's called Dropbox Portable AHK. So I'm going to double click to run this application. And when I do that, it opens up this window, which is the setup window. Now, most of the options are just fine, so we're going to be clicking a lot of nexts here. So I'm going to click Next, and when I get to step three here, I'm going to change something. So if I look at step three, this is where I want the folder to exist for Dropbox, and I would like it to exist not inside of the Portable Applications folder, but just on the root of my drive. So there was a little period slash Dropbox. I'm going to get rid of the period so that I have a folder that's just called Dropbox, and it's on the root of my drive. So it's root of my drive, Dropbox. So I see that with this little E and then Dropbox. That's it. Okay. Once I'm done with that, I'll go ahead and click Next. And again, if you get a little sidetracked in this process, I'll be around to help you, to, to, to walk you through this, to make sure that you get it uh, working. So don't worry about it if you get a little bit behind. I'm going to go ahead and click Next again. We'll go ahead and let it update automatically. That's fine. I'll click Next, Next, Next. And I get to this page. Okay, which is step eight. I have two things that I have to do on this page. One, there's a button for download Dropbox files. This actually is downloading the real from the Dropbox company Dropbox files. So I'm going to go ahead and get that. It's the most current version. 
and this will take a little bit of time to download. And below this, I have the ability to choose an icon that represents this Dropbox folder. Now, for me, I pick um, the red icon because it's distinctly different than the standard Dropbox icon. These computers all have Dropbox on their computer. Uh, those of you that were in 136 know that I've made that Dropbox folder for when you're doing your special renderings at the end and you do an autosave, it goes into that folder. It's backed up that way. Uh, but for the, the rest of us that aren't really using that, we want to make sure that we can distinguish this portable version of Dropbox from the one that's already running on these computers. The one that's running on these computers is over here, and it's kind of this whitish blue color right there. So I want to make something that's distinctly different. I pick the red one. If you want to pick a pink one or something, that's fine too, or a purple. Uh, really up to you. So I've gone ahead and I picked the red one. And now I need to wait for the balance of this uh, 60 megs or so, 56 megs, to finish downloading. So I'm going to come around <coughs> and help you guys get here, and then we'll continue again. OK, so my files have finished downloading. Uh, I can tell because this box is grayed out now. So again, I picked the red, and I'll go ahead and pick Next. And now I'll click on the Start Dropbox Setup, which will then open. I can say OK to this. It's fine. It will then open the standard Dropbox setup. And so as I was saying in the um, section about passwords, this is one example uh, where it's going to be annoying because I actually have to type in my random password. So I have to open it up on my laptop here. And once I have it open over here, I can then type it in over here. So bear with me for a second. And then I'll go ahead and click on sign in. Hopefully I didn't make a mistake, which apparently I did. Let's try it one more time. Sorry about that. What? Apparently, I can't type. Sorry about that. One more time. I think I accidentally had caps lock on. So when you get to this screen, this is one of the annoying things about the setup. Um, you'll click on Open My Dropbox Folder, and you get this sudden little message that says, wait a minute, I can't find my location. Go ahead and click Choose Another Location, and then just pick the C drive. And it will make no difference for the actual installation. It just needs it to, to move on. Um, so we'll go ahead and say yes there, and then I can go ahead and finish. It will ask me, do I want to restart my computer? Right? I would Pick no, just because I don't want to wait the 30 seconds that it'll take for it to restart. All right, And so if I give it a little bit of time, we can see I have the little spinning wheel next to my mouse. If we give it a little time, it's going to show up down here in my dock. There it is, the little red icon. And if we give it a little bit more time, it's going to be starting. There we go. And I can confirm that it actually is working by clicking on the icon. And it will then open up the folder right there. Yeah, there we go. Um, that is my Dropbox folder. So there's my flash drive, there's Dropbox, and here's the stuff that it's already downloading into that folder that was on my Dropbox. Okay. So anything that I save in my flash drive inside of this Dropbox folder will then be backed up to Dropbox, which is the idea. Okay. Um, the, the problem with this setup is that it won't automatically start when you put in your flash drive. So when I have my drive completely ejected, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and show you that. 
Um, sometimes you do, in fact, have to quit Dropbox before you can eject your drive. And then let me go ahead and eject my drive. By the way, it's, it's very good practice to actually go through and choose to eject your drive rather than just pulling it out. Make sure to get this safe to remove hardware because if you just pull it out, you're likely to corrupt data on your drive. Um, so there it is. I've unplugged it. And now I'll plug it back in. And as I said, in my case, it's a hard drive rather than a, um, a flash drive, but the, the, the work is the same. Now, I'm going to go ahead and open the file or open my folder. Now, it doesn't automatically start. And so I have to actually go in, and I'm going to go to Portable Applications, Dropbox Portable, and double click this AHK. This time, it won't start the setup. Right? Last time it started the setup. This time, it will just start Dropbox. And so if we give it a little bit of time, I'll get my red icon. There it is. It's starting, and it'll start syncing my files. Okay? So it is one extra step. It's something that you get, have to get in the habit of doing. I don't think it's particularly hard to do, but you have to remember to do it. And in older versions of the operating system, you used to be able to write a script that it would automatically do it. Uh, but for obvious virus protection reasons, they won't let us do that anymore uh, in Windows 7 and on. Okay? So that's the Dropbox portable installation. Okay? From here, I'm going to have you go and start working on your LinkedIn profile. Right? Oh, actually, I should show you the calendars really fast. Um, on the calendar, if you go to Tutorials, Digital Life, and then 0 0.5 for calendar feeds, or you could also do 0 0.11 to subscribe to a calendar in Google. To me, the 0 0.5 covers all of the various um, options that we have right here. Uh, so depending on whether you're in Outlook right, or you're in iCal on your computer, if you're in Google Calendar uh, or if you're in Yahoo Calendar, you can follow whichever set of steps is appropriate. Um, the bottom line is I'm going to do it in a Yahoo Calendar as an example. You're going to need the address that's listed under the A135-8356 or evening class. That's your calendar. Um, that way you don't have the stuff from this morning. You just have your stuff. Okay? So even though we're, we're doing the same thing, we're tracking the same, we have the same lectures on every day, et cetera, uh, this is just specific to you so you don't have duplicates. I've selected it all the way from beginning to end, making sure there's no extra spaces. And I'll go ahead and copy this so that I have the address. And then I'm going to go to my Yahoo calendar. And here it is in Yahoo. And to add it, I'm going to click on the little gear next to others. And this is actually almost identical to how you do it in uh, Google Calendar. Uh, you'll have something called Others, and you'll have a little triangle next to it. It works essentially the same way. You'll click on it, and you'll click on Follow Other Calendars. In Google, you would add. Um, excuse me, you would say uh, add calendar URL. Okay? It's essentially the same thing. And when we get here, I'll go ahead and say this is Archie 135. I can chase, change what color I want it to be. And I can go ahead and I can paste the iCal address. So control V for paste, or I could right click and say paste. And I'll get the calendar address. And then I'll go ahead and click continue. And when I do that, I'll wait for a second, and there it showed up here, 6 p.m., Archie 135. This is Lecture 101, right? Here's today, Lecture 102, Organizing and Developing an Online Presence, okay? You can also see the lab exercise. So it automatically fills in. I'm a little bit behind. I'll admit to that. I haven't filled in what all the lectures are, but I will do that um, and get that up. The good news is because it's an automatically updating calendar, the next time you log in, it'll have the most current information, okay? So that was how to subscribe in a Yahoo calendar. The other calendars are essentially the same. Um, but if you run into trouble and you want some help, I'd, of course, be happy to, to help you through that. Okay? So the email, part three, is optional. Part four is dealing with your LinkedIn page. Um, this is my LinkedIn page um, that gives information about me. Um, my profile strength is up high because I've spent a lot of time cultivating and actually working with it. And if we were to continue scrolling down, we'd have work experience of stuff that I do or have done, honors and awards, publications. Actually, this is a place where I need to update because the current version of the handbook is version 4.0. Um, and it's been published in 2016. So I need to do a few of that. Um, it also down here has endorsements. 
Um, this is a great way of, of kind of identifying what skills you have and people that are connected to you can actually say, yes, you have skills in certain areas. Um, I would like to be able to use this as a way of helping students uh, gain confidence in what skills that they have. So like those of you that have gone through 136, Rhino and V-Ray, I'd be happy to endorse you and your skills in that if we become uh, LinkedIn friends or, or whatever you want to call it. So uh, certainly something that you can, can work. As I co continue down here, I have education. Where did I go to school? Other interests, uh, groups that I'm a part of, et cetera. Okay? So you'll want to start filling it out. You by no means need to get to all-star status in your profile strength. Right? If you just have a basic profile, that's perfectly fine. Um, we are going to use the address for LinkedIn. And you'll see that my LinkedIn address is linkedin.com slash in slash Grant A. Adams. Right? Yours by default, if you've never customized it, will be some string of numbers. Again, this is an opportunity to personalize it. You can do that by clicking the little um, gear icon next to the web name. And then up here in the right corner, you can edit your public URL. Uh, which is essentially letting you create linkedin.com slash in slash your name or something like that. Okay? So I would encourage you to do that, and we're going to use this address a little bit later on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause, come around and help anybody that has any trouble. We'll work for 30 minutes or so on your, or 20 minutes on your LinkedIn profile, something like that, and then we'll come back and I'll show you the personal landing page stuff. Okay? Some of you have already jumped way ahead and are working on your personal landing page. That's perfectly fine. Um, but I will, just in order, in order to make sure that everybody kind of tracks along, I'm going to stop before I actually talk about the personal landing page. Okay? Are there any questions about this so far? No? Good. OK, so there appear to be people that are kind of winding into the flavors.me realm. Uh, and so I want to show you a few things uh, relating to that. Obviously, you have to be patient while it tries to register you. Uh, but when you're setting things up, I want to walk through a few pieces of it. Uh, and then I'll also walk through kind of the end of what we're doing in part five and part six today. So I already have a flavors.me page that I've, I've established. But I want to show you how to customize it such that you can get a feed for the stuff that you post on the Digital Tools for Architects site. So for example, let me minimize this design center here so that we can look at my page as a whole. If I were to click on the Digital Tools for Designers and Architects Grant.Adams link here, it would bring up some content on the side of things that I have posted on the course website. Right? So this is a great way of cross-posting, cross-integrating the stuff that you do. It's nothing that you have to do. Once you set it up, you forget all about it, but it'll still do it as part of your personal landing page. So I'm going to go back here to the design section and pull this up. And I'm going to look under the content section. And I'm going to click on the Add button. And from here, I can actually start to add various services. I think in the free version of this, you're limited to five services. So you can think about what you really want to include. Um, what we're going to be adding is an RSS feed. And to make my life easy, I'm going to go back to the Digital Tools site. I'm going to go to Tutorials, Digital Life, and then 0.12, which is the flavors.me page. And what I want is I want this address right here. It's digitaltoolsforarchitects.com slash author slash author name slash feed. And what is bold, this author name here, I'm going to replace with what I use to log into the digital tools site. Okay, so in the case of what I was just working on, it would be grant.adams. If it was my other account, it would be gadams, right? So I'm going to replace where it says author name with whatever I use to log in. And so when I come back here to the flavors.me page, I'm going to click on the RSS button. And I'm going to paste in this field that value. But I'm going to replace where it says author name with my username. So I'll use my gadams because I already have the grant.adams one. And I'll click Connect. And once I've done that, it will add my feed. And so now over here, I have the digital tools for architects, the grant.adams. And this one is the grant Adams, the other account. So if I were to click on that, I'd get the post from that account. Okay, So you'll do it just for one. And then of course, you could add other services that are listed. Oh. Uh, I'm at the end of my services. So I'd have to delete one to be able to. So hold on a second. 
Notice that I can change the name of this. So I get the weird ampersand code here, but we can get rid of that. And that would, that would clean it up a little bit. Um, that's, that's a choice that I can make, but I can also delete one of these um, services to continue to add more services. You'll notice that I've also included <coughs> a link to my Vimeo account and the various videos that I posted there. Also a link to my um, YouTube account that includes all of the videos that I posted on my YouTube account. So I'm trying to cross-link the stuff that I create. Okay? So once I'm done with this part of it, uh, at the top of yours, you'll be able to click on Publish. Obviously, mine's already published, and I've picked my username. So my name is grantadams.flavors.me. Right? I don't really care about the rest of this information, just the grantadams.flavors.me. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this link once I've published, and I'm going to go over to the Digital Tools site. I'll go under my black bar here. I'll go to my dashboard. And then I'm going to click on my profile, which once we get there, I will click on it. All right, so I'll click on profile. And once I pick up my uh, profile here, as I come down, we can see that there's extra information that I can include about myself. Not all of this has been filled in. Some of it has already. Um, I have my first name. I have my last name. All right, I have my username. I have my email. And then under website, I'm going to paste in my flavors.me website. Okay, that's my home page. And then also under LinkedIn, I'm going to paste in my LinkedIn profile, which is linkedin.com slash in slash Grant A. Adams. Okay? So I now have my LinkedIn and my flavors.me. Now I also have a YouTube account, so I could paste that in as well. Um, and you can see that there's other options if I wanted to include pay Facebook or, or whatever. And I, again, I can choose what I want to include. Once I'm done, I'll go ahead and click the update user profile. Okay? For me, I also have a picture. If you're interested in adding a picture, there's a tutorial for how to do that. It's under Tutorials, Digital Life, 0.13. That's optional. You don't have to do it. But if you want to, you can as well uh, to add the picture. So what happens now is that when I create a post, and so let's go to one of my recent posts here so we can get a good example. All right, so this is a post that I made last class. Exercise 101. Okay. You see that on the right side of my post, which includes my picture and the information about the post that I made, on the right side here, it says about the author, there's my name. And right below my name, there's two little icons that show up. One is a home and one is a LinkedIn icon. If I were to click on the home, it would take me right to my flavors.me page. Okay. If I went to the little LinkedIn, it would take me right to my LinkedIn page. Okay. So what happens is when I create a post on the site, when Google goes and crawls this page or when Yahoo crawls the page and gets information, right? they see that I posted this and I posted this information, and they associate this content with these two links, which are my home page and my LinkedIn profile. So as those things come together, it starts to associate and I start to brand myself, which is the whole idea. So I'm going to have you update your profile so it includes your flavors.me and your LinkedIn page. Okay? If you'd like to include more, and actually if we go to some of the stuff that I've done later on, we can see if, uh, let me see if I can get one that has it. Here's one with my primary account. You can see that I have my home page. I have Facebook. I have Twitter. I have LinkedIn. I have um, Flickr. I have YouTube videos. I have Google+. So all of that is me, and it's all branded together in association with this particular temp or, uh, tutorial that I wrote up. Okay? So it's a way of kind of connecting the two pieces together. Okay? So once I've updated that, I do need to make a post for today's lecture and, or for today's exercise. And I'm going to do that by using one of two things. Uh, let me go ahead and open a brand new uh, browser here. See if I can open a new tab. New window. 
I'm going to go to my flavors.me page. So it's Grant Adams, oops, if I can type, .flavors.me. It is. And I want to take a screenshot of this page. Now, for some of you, you'll be able to hit the print screen key on the keyboard, which will bring up this print key 2000, and you'll be able to save the, the image. Um, some of the computers didn't have that for some unknown reason, in which case you can use a tool called a snip or something like that, snipping tool. Right? So I just started searching for snipping tool. And once I have that, it will open the snipping tool. I can say I want a new uh, window snip, which will then snip this window. And then I can save this. So I'll go to File, Save As. I'll save it to my flash drive. So let me go to my flash drive here, right there. I want it to be in Dropbox. I want it to be in 135, and it's exercise 102. And we'll call this Capture. That's fine. I'll go ahead and click Save, which is then my video. I'll jump over to my other set. I'm going to go to New, followed by Post. And this is going to be exercise 102 by me. And I would like two things. One, I'd like a link to my profile. So I'll go ahead and I forget whether I still have it saved here. No, it doesn't look like it. So let me go ahead and type my link here. All right. And I can make it a live link by clicking the chain. There it is. It's a live link. And I'm going to scroll all the way down to set a featured image. This will be my screenshot, which I can get to inside of my Dropbox folder. It is right there under Capture. And once it uploads, I'll be able to set my featured image. And it should show up here in the lower right corner. There it is. And I'm also going to scroll back up. And under Categories, make sure I categorize this correctly. This is Digital Tools for Designers. It is Exercise 102. And once I'm done with that, I'll go ahead and click the Publish icon. All right, so now that it's published, that's what I needed to turn in. That's the end of step six, or part six for today. So once you get through that and you finish part six, um, you're done. And that's all we need to do for today. Okay? Question for everybody or personal question? Okay, I'll come over and we'll, we'll double check it. Any other global concerns? No? All right.